Okay, to be fair, this is recorded two days after the previous one. After a couple heavy doses of antibiotic and uh, cortisone and feeling better and all of that. Still got a couple more days left of that stuff, but we need to record enough for the weekend. And uh, we got load shedding again, so yay. Yay and yay. A quick thank you to the T5 peeps. Bob the Dragon, Data Magnet, Cat Crab Lobster, Dark Machine, Estrella the Dreamer, Mesic, Pudic Yol, Casper Arnholtz, and Chaos to Mist. Thank you very much. Anyways, on to the story. You have been sentenced to death in a magical court. Blah, blah, blah. Chapter 3 A massive group of orange flames shot up from a cave entrance high in the dragon spire, high above the celestial plain. Yeah, a voice echoed out from the cave. I used supernova as a mouthwash. This ain't gonna do crap. The reply was a booming, angry roar and another blast of flame, brighter and hotter. Damn, the voice echoed. That was pretty good, but uh, check this out. A tremendous blue-white blast shot forth, filling the entire cave mouth, instantly liquefying the walls, causing the molten lava to pour out. Or Yeah, thought so. Now carry your ass outside. Do I look like a ficking porter? I ain't carrying crap. Well, that's not my problem. Oh, not leaving without it. Well, I guess I could put it in your prison pocket for you. What's a prison pocket? Let me enlighten you. Hold still. What? You don't need it after all. Great. Uh, move. Moments later, a titanic dragon emerged sheepishly from the cave and hid behind the faintly glowing deer woman, whispering urgently in her ear. She looked up accusingly at the bathrobe-clad Homo erectus, ambling out of the cave, pausing to push his foot into some lava, leaving a print. Just what is it with you and bottoms? she demanded. Physics. How does your sorcery apply to this nonsense? It's not sorcery. It's one of the universal laws, the ape man chuckled. Everything seeks its lowest energy state. For every action, there is an opposite and equal reaction. And if someone is being difficult, threaten to shove something up their rear. And if they seem into it, show them something bigger. It's a universal motivator. Simple physics. I think it's awfully rude. Well, the humanoid said, strolling up to her. Has it failed thus far? No. See? The hominid reply. Universal motivator. Physics! Is that the last one? The ape man asked as, as Vaughn comforted the rather shaken dragon. Yes. She sighed as her dappled cape magically extended covering the gigantic beast and then retracting leaving no trace of the ancient wireham. What? I just, um, she sighed, tears welling up in her eyes. There's, there's just so many I could save. So, so many. I, I know there was a war, but I do. And I, I don't blame you. What she did. Whatever that is. She stammered, gesturing to the massive moon-sized black sphere dominating the realm. Time has stopped around it. Therefore, all emissions from the impossibly bright and hot sphere have ceased. Actually, the human reply, I didn't do it. One of my humans did. He said proudly. Crazy Fecker went and did something crazy. Even I left those Feckers alone, he said, pointing at the gigantic black sphere. Because they'll do stuff just like that. The owls, dwarves, and orcs aren't the first sapiens that those murderous jerks wipe out. Not by a long shot. You don't even want to know what happened to my actual favorites, which might be one of the reasons why I let your guys have them. God, they were jerks, he added fondly. Tears began to flow down Bourne's cheeks. I, I don't confess, I, I don't understand, but I believe you, kind God. She looked down. But regardless of your reason, she wept. I lost so many, but with your aid, I was able to save so many others. Thank you. Yeah, the ape man shrugged. Life's a bitch sometimes, he said, trying to ignore the constant whimpering and fearful murmurs radiating from Fawn. Where's mommy? A frightened little voice squeaked through the ether. Your mommy? Born silently replied as tears rolled down her cheek. Your mommy isn't here right now. She's, uh, she's, she's fine, dear. 
I'm scared. I want my mommy. The little boy silently wailed. Oh, for fuck's sakes, the hominid groaned, looking skyward. He glared at Fawn. Tell the little shit that a goddamn mommy is on her way, he groaned. Jesus fucking Christ. But powerful and kind God, Fawn replied. She has already been consumed by the great sphere, the one from which you said there is no escape. First lesson, the hominid said firmly. Never, ever, ever do what I'm about to do. Vec with causality, even a little bit. And you can wreck an entire universe. No, you will wreck an entire universe. But... He flashed her a mischievous look and grinned. The universe is a ready fact. Wait, right here. Literally, right here. Do not move from the spot. Got it? Vaughn nodded. The hominid started to walk away. He stopped. And another thing, he said, fixing her with an irritated glare. Stop calling me a fecky god. I'm not a god or a god or any of that crap. And neither are you. Hubris is fatal, even to us, so stop putting that crap on me. It's getting on my nerves. Muttering a constant stream of obscenities, the ape man stumped down the mountain path. A short while later, the hominid reached into the edge of the giant pitch black sphere. I can't be fucking leave. I'm doing this, he grumbled. Took a deep breath and moved, not forward, backwards, left or right, but he started stepping before. As he did so, the sphere started to retreat, slowly shrinking back towards the portal from which it had come. Soon, it was gone and a bright light could be seen in the distance as he re-entered the normal 3 plus 1 D space. I'm going to completely lose my crap. He grinned as he headed in that direction. The ape man was lounging in his chair at the portal's entrance. He took a big handful of popcorn, anticipating the look on those three idiots' faces. This was going to be fun. Hey! An entirely too fecking familiar voice said from behind him. What the feck, dude? He said as he spun around to face himself. Dude, he replied. I'm going to need something. Whoa, he said, backing away. That was the one time thing. The 70s were a crazy time, you know. Yeah, crazy. I remember the time I made a bet with Oscar Wilde. He snorted. Some mistakes just have to be made, right? Shame about Oscar, though. We died far too soon. Yeah. Well, that was the least stupid reason you are here. Can I even know? Probably best you don't, he replied. Let's just say that the universe is fecked anyway, so what the hell? Fair enough. Gonna freeze me. Yep. Just wanted to give you a heads up so you didn't freak out and accidentally kill me. Last thing we need is a paradox on top of the crap I'm pulling. Cool. Uh, hope you know what you're doing, he shrugged. Christ, you're the only one ugly bastard. You know that? You too, asshole. With that, the hominid waved his hand. He really didn't have to, but it looked cool and one of him, and everything behind him, rose in place. Right, he grumbled, as he pulled out a large scroll that unfurled and rolled for dozens of meters. Let's see. The fairy plume father sang to herself as she hovered in front of a green berry bush, grabbing a huge, perfectly bright berry, and fluttering her wings rapidly to pull herself, herself, and it away. Oh, Pino will love this, she sighed heavily. Her daughter just loved gleanberry steaks. What's that? She asked herself curiously as she noticed a bright light shining between the trees ahead. Fascinated, she started to fly towards it. Yeah, a grump voice said as the strangest looking fella appeared next to her. You really don't want to head that way. Oh, 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 hello. She squeaked as a rough hand snatched her out of the air and shoved her in the back. Okay, the voice grumbled. Mommy's safe. One down. He looked at his list. Uh, Twenty thousand to go. Vaughn dutifully stood exactly where she was told. She turned excitedly as she heard a long stream of invictors coming up the path. The good sir, definitely not a god, had returned. He soon appeared carrying a huge sack on his shoulder. Okay, he growled. His bathrobe, dingy and a bit tattered. All of your children are safe and fecking sound. 
he let the bag fall to the ground, where it issued thousands of yelps, squeaks, and hisses. Happy now! Vaughn cried out in delighted relief as she ran forward to embrace the ape man. Thank you, kind sir, she gasped. Thank you, thank you. She kissed him on the cheek. Oh, whatever. The harmon and crumble. Just grab the little shits. We have to leave now. I just had one night stand with the causality, and she's gonna find out the condom broke any second now. Spoiler, she does not like it. Why? Bon asked. They are delicious. Just grab your kids before mine wind up all over our faces. What? Grab the fucking bag and let's get out of here, the ape man hissed, looking around anxiously. Vaughn daintily opened the bag and started withdrawing the occupants one at a time, each one magically growing to the full size before magically disappearing under a cape. Oh, for feck's sakes! The ape man yelled and grabbed the bag, swept Vaughn under his arm, and disappeared. Vaughn looked around in delight. She was swimming amongst the stars. Can you breathe okay? The ape man asked as he drifted nearby. Yes, she replied in confusion. Good, he replied. And to answer your question, no, you normally wouldn't be able to breathe out here. And probably actually don't have to, but it would freak you out. In any event, your uh, children would definitely have a hard time. I just grabbed up some elements and whipped up a batch of air. Let me know if it gets stuffy. Thank you again, kind sir. She said as she pulled out a long and very confused fish out of the bag and slipped it under a coat. She silently retrieved various creatures from the bag as the ape man floated nearby, staring at an ever-expanding brilliant white sphere. Vaughn looked up at the curious creature in the robe. I am sorry, she said, looking downcast. What for? he asked, never taking his eyes off the sphere. It's, um, it's my fault. She said, burying her head in her hands. Do tell, the ape man smiled, the light from the literal end of the universe shining in his eyes. He, he elves and, and the dwarves and, and, she started to weep. Oh, my fault. No, the ape man gasped, his eyes wide with shock and horror. It's true, she wailed. I, I didn't mean for them to, to, to be, to, I, I trusted them, she cried. I know, he replied. You do? Not my first rodeo, sweetie, he said, still staring at the glowing hellball. Then you still help me? Yep, he shrugged, still transfixed. Why? I'm a capricious and merciful, he replied. It's how I roll. Besides, you aren't a bad sort, you just fecked up, that's all. Most universe, I... I do not know what you mean. You just answered my question. The ape man replied, looking away from the fundamental devastation for the first time. Pantheons are a classic noob mistake. The only times they don't result in exactly what happened to you, or worse, is when everyone splits up early and goes their own way, each one taking with them a chunk of idiot number one. Don't worry, it will grow back. I was just so lonely. Reason number three for why idiots form pantheons. The ominid replied, smiling at her. And the only one that is remotely acceptable. Number one and two are vanity and laziness. So you just sort of popped into being one day. She nodded. The world was young and I was alone and I made bow and the trees and breathed life into all the world's children. But the knowledge and ability and urge to manipulate matter and create life. Sounds like you're a wild Boltzmann. The hominid said sympathetically. Big off. A Boltzmann? It's been known to happen, he replied. Literally, everything happens somewhere, somewhen. Sometimes what we call a Boltzmann brain lasts only of moments, and sometimes they stick around. Every now and again, they can either get or be able to form a body. But ten to a bajillion bubbles popping into existence, every ten to the bajillionth of a second, literally anything is possible. No matter how stupidly improbable, doesn't explain your soul, though. I guess some soul could have been sucked in during the inflation, or maybe there was a big kill-off when nearby universe collapsed or something. The chances of all this lining up are impossibly low, which means it's bound to happen. And uh, here you are. I'm sorry, Vaughn stammered. I, I don't understand. 
Don't worry about it, he replied. You will, or you won't. Doesn't really matter. Are your children okay? Yes, she replied happily. They're coming out the bag whole and hearty. Cool, uh, because I was just stuffing the little motherfuckers in there, he chuckled. Perhaps one day you will realize exactly how stupid I was getting those little shits. Was it perilous? Very. I'm truly grateful, kind sir, she replied. But why? Why would you risk so much for someone who's wronged you so badly? He grumbled. Too quiet for her to hear. Sir, I said that there has been enough death one day, he muttered a bit louder. We need to pull back a bit. Even we don't want to get caught up in this big beautiful baby there. He gently grabbed her arm as they moved impossibly quickly away from the glowing sphere. Here, he said after a few moments. This will give us a nice view and a little bit of time before we have to move again. How big is it going to be? The hominid laughed. Jacob Roberti, the beautiful maniac whose name I will carry for untold eons, has done a number on my happy little home. That sphere will never stop growing. It'll continue to expand, consuming everything in its path forever. Even when the stars cease to shine, this motherfucker still will be. Not that you can actually see it in real time. I'm playing a few tricks to make this possible. This is sort of an artist's rendition of what is actually going on out there, but it's 100% accurate. It'll never stop. Nope, he replied, and swept his arm across the stars. Pretty much everything you see here will be utterly destroyed. I've destroyed your home. I've destroyed yours, the hominid chuckled. It's only fair, but no, you haven't destroyed my home, not all of it. Jacob Robati, exalt he's named it. Oh, he is going to rub a huge ass chunk out of it, but most of it will survive intact. I don't build crap. I have a little safeguard in place for just this sort of thing. I never stops growing, then won't it consume everything in the end? That's why you add a little fudge factor to the constants, he smiled. It's some of that physics I keep talking about. It can expand forever and still never reach most of what I built. I don't understand. Don't worry. He smiled, putting his arm around her. You will. End of chapter. And end of miniseries. There will be more adventures of the great Erectus and Fawn in the future. But for now, we are at an end. And that, my friends, concludes 